On today's show, I talk with Grey Chow, an award-winning travel photographer from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. His extensive portfolio of nature, architectural, and landscape work is impressive and has been published on various media platforms like BBC News, Digital SLR Photography, Asian Geographic, and Lonely Planet. Gray also leads photography tours throughout Asia and teaches photography in Kuala Lumpur as well as online in his masterclass community. Although Gray excels in a number of photographic genres, most of our conversation focuses on one of his greatest passions, astrophotography. With that said, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Gray Chow. How you doing, Gray Chow? Good to see you, man. Yeah, yeah, it's really good to see you, especially, you know, seeing our last met was like two years ago. <laughs> Thank you, pandemic. And now with us, yeah, yeah, when the pandemic just started, and uh, I think it's kind of interesting. You were on once my Facebook live uh, as a guest speaker, and now it's my turn to be on exactly your show, yeah. which is also a great Thank honor. You, man. Yeah, great honor to have you here. And and we've also met up a bunch of times in Malaysia. We did the meetup together in. Uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, we, we thought we would only get like, you know, 20, 30 people. And there were like over 100 who showed up for our meetup, yes, our free yes, meetup yes, that yes, we did yes, there. It's a huge event. That was pretty funny. And then we've, yeah. we've shot together in um, the Genting Highlands a few times. Um, so, yeah. Kemal yeah. Highlands. And in yeah. Kuala Lumpur, so a Kuala Lumpur, Nen. of course. And I think we met in, I was trying yeah. to think when we met. That was back in 2015 when... Um, I went to um, Malaysia. I was taking a trip with Jimmy and uh, Julian B Boy, and oh no, he was there, and we met up with you yes, there. And you yes. were, yeah, yeah, Julian was. That yes, was an yes. awesome time. Exactly. Well, um, you know, after you mentioned those uh, time, I was like, wow, I miss traveling a lot. I do too, <laughs> and it's part of the reason why. I, it's Yay. part of the reason why I started doing this because today I was hoping to live vicariously through your your photos. So I wanted to talk about uh, your travels uh, in the Spiti Valley. Um, in that's in India, uh, right? Is it in India or Nepal? Yes, yeah, okay. India is in northern India. So it actually is somewhere at a border close to mm -hmm. Nepal, and it's on the Himalaya mountain range. So it's very, very, I mean, it's India, but a lot of people, you know, my friend told me that, yeah, it's India, but it's not those kind of typical India that, mm -hmm. you know, because it's somewhere more like Tibet. Right. Because of their people, their culture is closer to people in Tibet or Nepal. Yeah. So, so um, and it's very, very far north. I'm, yep. I'm looking at your photo of the monastery that you uh, shot at, I think it was 50 millimeters. Um, it's the, not the Star Trails, ah, just yeah. the, the monastery and then the Milky Way are right behind it. With the Milky I mean, Way. It's photos like yeah. that, that when I yeah. see that, it makes me just want to go there. You know, like it just has this kind of mystical feel to it. it makes me want to go up into the mountains. Was there one particular image or like what drew you to the Spiti Valley? Actually, when I saw Spiti Valley, it's, it's from another angle. Someone shoot that the same monastery, uh, the key monastery, which I have one with a statue, which is from the opposite direction. Okay, because it's on the, from the opposite direction, so that I won't be able to get a Milky Way from that angle. But I was managed to get sunset and also the statue. And when I look at the, monaster, mon the monastery, I was so impressed. You know, it's surrounded by the snow cape mountains and it's in the valley and the the shape the shape is like a fortress, you know. It's like a fortress. So then after I check on it, then it's actually a monastery. And one thing is very interesting about Spiti Valley is that there are so many monasteries there. And almost every monastery has has at least one thousand 1,000 years old wow. history. Yes, 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 yes. And and you know what? Uh, I'm kind of, you know, like crazy photographer. <laughs> you know, because I want to capture the shot. So I choose not to being 
too good to mm-hmm. myself. You know, like instead of saying at you know there's a town, but the town will take around like like maybe around like thirty or forty minutes around that to travel from the town to the monastery. And because I, I want to save down the travel time to have more time to take more Let's, photos. Hold on. And at the same Let's time... Let's be honest. Also, you wanted to be able to wake up later or get more sleep too while you're shooting your shot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's just more convenient. It's just more convenient. And yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Well, that's, and, what, it is, that's what it is for me. And also... T- that's what it is for me yeah, but... Okay, I, I think I'm going to explain that okay. but later. Uh, because I also think that it may not be that safe to travel in the dark right. at that area. Because it's so dark, you know, it's like it's so bumpy and you are on a mountain range which is above 4,000 altitude. It's very cold too. So, um, yeah, so it's, I don't really recommend, I don't know, I don't really see people travel, you know, in at night. But, you know, it's a very remote and very exotic place. So that's why there are few village but scattered around the, the whole area. So it's very wide and basically not really having anyone, you know, there. Uh, but we are we were staying in a monastery. We are not staying in, you know, you know, we are not staying in the, in the like, hotel uh, or homestay, but a monastery. We were staying. We were staying in a ho- in a hostel, in that key monastery itself, and it's very very uncomfortable. <laughs> Are you? It's very very uncomfortable. So that's that's the but that's the but, okay. But you know, before that, I was like, wow, it would be cool to stay in in a monastery. You know, <laughs> I've done that too. And I've... like at night, we can go out from right. Milky Way, and the next day morning, woke up. We can walk out. We can just shoot some monks. You know, there are monks there. It's a monastery. You know, that would be nice. You know, we'll have beautiful lights in the early morning, but it's very very uncomfortable. Okay, very very uncomfortable. And uh, but in a chain, the experience is so special. It's so unique, and you can feel that when I talk about that. Even now, you can still feel the excitement from me. Okay, because. You know, let's talk about the uncomfortable part first. First, you are staying in a hostel. Well, it's not just a normal hostel. It's a monastery. Okay? The moment I went to the, into my bedroom, I saw there's a, you know, a hole, a big hole at the roof. <laughs> you know, and the cold air keep coming in. You know, it's at 4,000 altitude, you know, nearby the Snow Cave Mountain, just the winter just passed. It was kind of cold. It's definitely below uh, 10 degree. At night, it's definitely below 0 degree, or at least around that. Okay, so you can see that the cold air keep coming in the room. And I was so cold, and then, and then I just have to walk around there. I realized that there's a, they have to use a ball, wooden ball, to cover the, the hole and put a rock, put a stone on the top there. Okay, to hold it. So I, I walk out to the, roof, to the roof, then I managed to close the, 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 the hole. On, on above my room, which luckily I did that. El- else I won't be able to sleep because it's very, very cold. One is the cold, one is the humidity. It's very, very dry. Okay, especially in Malaysia, it's wet. We are hot, but it's wet. Okay, but in the, at there, it's cold and dry. So it's very, very hard for us to adapt to that. So I have time that, you know, at night I was trying to sleep. It's so cold. And... It's not that comfortable because, you know, it's a hostel, it's in a monastery. So we are sleeping on a mattress. It's a very basic, very basic, very basic equipment. I have no problem with that. Uh, the mattress, sorry, the blanket is as thick as the mattress, <laughs> which I can't tell which one is the mattress or the blanket. It's heavier. It's very heavy. And when I put it on me that time, it's, it's very hard to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so heavy, you know, and and then at night it's cold, so you have a running nose because you know, and then you're trying to breathe through your mouth, and when you try to breathe through your mouth, your throat will get dry 
dried up the next day. Okay, and it's painful. Okay, so uh, it's very cold at night. So when for you know when for dinner or lunch that time they serve us lunch, breakfast, dinner. You eat what the monks eat. Rice and uh, vegetables. <laughs> don't don't expect. Don't expect special treatment. Okay, here's the fun part. Here's the fun part. Okay, when it, people talk about you know monastery, people talk about like um Buddhist, oh vegetarians, right? Yeah, vegetarians. So vegetarian, just like you mentioned, vegetarian is vegetables, right? No, there's no vegetables. Because they're up in the mountains. Rice, potatoes, fruit, carrots, pea. Yeah, yeah. potato, those kind yeah. of stuff. You're going to eat that for the, for days. You know, whenever I'm in Spiti Valley, not just monastery, because I spend like, I spend like three three days two night in monastery, and then I move on to another homestay. But basically, whatever we eat is around the same. Okay, so they serve us like, you know, like those you watch on the on a movie. Uh, you know, it's kind of experience. You know, I'm not saying something not good. I'm kind of, I feel kind of interesting. Although I won't say that. Uh, you know, like. The coldness is something that will be hard to bear, but for more, I'm quite okay with that. I say it's kind of interesting experience, you know. Uh, they serve the food in the steel bucket. <laughs> they put two bucket on the table, <laughs> and and you have your own plate, the steel plate. Fork, I think. No, we have only spoon. Yeah, one steel plate, and uh, one spoon, one plastic bowl. Everyone has. Everyone has that, um. So during during the dinner or lunch, the time we had to carry our bowl and went to the dining room. We have to have our own dining room, but basically we eat the food is the same as the monks eat. So and then we had to serve ourselves after we done. We had to wash it and then bring back all those bowl and and plates into our room. Okay. Uh. So basically, it's like you know, like dao, you know, dao. One, what? Malaysia, mm -hmm. we also have dao. Dao is like. Something like the way, you know, it's the like way gravy, but it's without yeah. the meat. But they use the pea, you know, bean, and then just cook it together. Basically, that's what we eat almost every day. And flour. Uh, oh, and it's maybe um soybean, maybe, like um, yeah, yeah. like yeah, like yeah, like maybe like a soybean. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember, like a fermented soybean. You know, roti canai, roti canai. Yes. Yep. Roti canai in Malaysia. Right. The the yellow sauce. Yep. It's yep. not a curry. That's a dal. Okay. Yeah, oh, dal, dal, okay, dal is from in, um, yeah. lentils. It's like a lentil mashed lentils are kind of like a lentil base. Something like How that. How about yeah. um, altitude yeah. sickness? So, four thousand. Uh, luckily, I didn't mm -hmm. suffer that because um, we took around like two or three days. I think three days uh, to around two or three days okay. to get there. It's very very t tough to get there. But the good thing with that is that you know Ladakh. Ladakh is more famous compared to Spiti Valley, but Spiti Valley is actually quite close to Ladakh. Okay, well, when I say close, it's not something like you can just drive an hour to go there, but it's basically in the same same uh region, and but Ladakh is so famous because of the accessibility. Right. But Spiti Valley is not. <laughs> there's no flight to to reach there directly, so uh, there's a flight to reach a place there nearby, but we still have to take, you know. Uh, a transport to get us there, but you know the flight is very bad. Okay, the one to mention flight name, so they just cancel our flight. So we ch we have no choice but we bought the the train ticket. So we took the train. We we spent from where? Where? Uh, from New De for New Delhi, mm -hmm. New Delhi. So you flew into New Delhi to, from Malaysia, then took a train from New Delhi to where? To Chantiga, if I know me. Chantiga. Yeah, from Chantiga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, San Chantigar. Uh, yeah. Then I took. Then the driver will pick us up there, and we had to go to a place called Nakanda. If I'm not okay. mistaken, the name okay, because it's just a a a a, a rest stop for us to spend a the night there. Okay. Then only we able to enter Spiti Valley. Well, it's not. It's not really enter the Spiti Valley. We actually stop at Kappa. Kappa is very close on in Spiti Valley. Okay. So one night Chandiga, one night. Nakanda it should be Nakanda the name, and uh, Kappa, and then you can see that. So the fourth night only, the fourth day only, we are in Spiti Valley. So you did this all through a tour. I think you mentioned it was you. you so you have, yeah, and you went a with a few friends. So 
you, you, how many were you? How yeah. many in total were you? And then I guess you had a van and you had a driver and then they organized the yes. um, places to stay and, and all that. Or is that what you did? Yes, 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 yes. Six, six of us, six of us. Yeah, so from the Chaniga after the train, uh, the pickers are there. So those is arranged by then. Yeah, but we also have to deal with the the agency because I don't know whether it's a communication problem or or something else. You know, like there are things that they don't really highlight to us in advance. Like you know, they didn't tell us that you need passport photo. You need to apply permit for <laughs> Speedy Valley. I know about the permit, but I didn't know that they, they need passport photo. And he, he didn't mention that. Only the the time that he came, the driver came to pick us. The time only he told us that. Then only I was like, oh, and you're in no, some. You're, I have to get. You're in some village with like no, yeah. <laughs> no place to take a photo with all this camera gear. Yeah, luckily. <laughs> Yeah, luckily we still at a yeah exactly. Luckily we still in the town, so we asked the driver to bring us around to find a studio. It's kind of funny, you know, like few of us are photographers, including myself. One of my friend is actually you know the camera shop mm -hmm. owner, and we had to went in a studio, <laughs> a locker to take the photo. I was like, mm, okay, it's kind of funny. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but like I said, you know, sometimes, uh. You know, these kind of things, right? When it happens that time, you feel like, oh, very frustrated, uh, very annoyed. But after that, I will tell you, this kind of incident make a very good this, story. The, yeah, it makes a great story. And it's, the, it's these kind of challenges along the way and all these obstacles that you overcome to, <laughs> to get the image or to, to arrive at the place that actually makes it really worthwhile. And in the moment, it's really yeah. frustrating. And you're like, this is ridiculous. But in the end, you yeah. look back and you're like, remember when we slept on the floor and the yeah. blanket was as big as the mattress? You know, it's like those kind of things that you, yeah, you kind yeah, of yeah, 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 those kind cherish. of things. So um, did the dry, did your, your tour guide, did you have a, a driver and a guide or was it just, a, was the driver the guide? And if so, did they, were they also a photo guide as well? Or did you plan out your locations and say, Take, take me here on I day on one, here on myself. day two, and made it like a tailor-made tour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll, yes, I already pre-planned the, the whole itinerary. I already done that. And, you know, after discuss with the with the agents, see? And then, yes, yeah, so I just got the driver. So, but I would say that it's, you know, like the usual, there's uh, miscommunications. So when I went there, that the, type, the driver relented to went up at night. So we have to deal with that. So we have to deal with that, and we try. We also have to deal with the, his boss, because uh, there's no si there's no signal there. You know, you can't call <laughs> in Speedy Valley. Your phone is down, so it's so very hard to complain to his boss. So we also try to deal with that kind of situation there. Yeah, but still, you know, uh, the journey to that is also kind of interesting. It's very, you know, they told me that. On the email, they told me that this is one of the most adventurous, adventurous road in the world. In a nice way of saying. Do you mean, most, do you mean most dangerous? <laughs> do you mean most dangerous? <laughs> yes, it's the same word. Things when they say adventurous, it just you know like for marketing purpose, they just package you know coat it with sweet, and uh, but it's actually one of the most dangerous route. Uh, we were driving on the cliff. <laughs> It's insane. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of <laughs> insane. It's kind of insane. But for their local, they it's are nothing, like yeah. it's nothing. It's right. nothing. It's, it's nothing. A you know, road. like there's a mini mini bus, and you know, it's a mini bus coming from the front and want, want wanted to get through, and our driver won't stop. You know, he also wanted to squeeze through. So both car vehicle trying to squeeze through on a very small route on the a cliff. You know, it's like, it's very bumpy. You know, it's not a proper route. You know, it's like full with those uh, marbles. So it's just very bumpy. And when they want to squeeze through their time, uh, our car actually bumped into their side mirror. So it's just like knock, knock their side mirror. And then the their driver, you know, the the bus, the minibus driver was like, oh, just coming back. <laughs> and it's like nothing. I was like, wow, impressed. <laughs> you know, but you know, with like, with, there are several times we were 
screaming. We were screaming, mm-hmm. you know, like the dog. Sh- it's kind of it's kind of insane, you know. Like that's a very fun story that we have with our driver, you know, uh, because we are photographers. Whenever we see like, wow, that's a beautiful scenery, then we were very excited and was like, whoa, stop, 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 we want to take a photo. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. <laughs> okay. <coughs> when, we, when we did that, our driver actually speed up <laughs> on the cliff, run t- ran toward the cliff, and then did an emergency brake at, on the cli- at the cliff there. You know, we're like, hey, stop, 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 wait, 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 wait. And then everyone also is just screaming at the end, you know? And the driver's like, just smiling. It's like, <laughs> and just like that. And then after a few times, we learn. Uh, so we will tell the driver like, okay, slow down, slow, 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 slow. <laughs> okay, stop. <laughs> Okay, they don't park in the in the inner lane. They just like to park the the lane that you know close to the edge. I don't know why people say you know. So that's why he just like to stop there, you know. So we have this kind of experience. You know, it's it's kind of interesting and it's kind of wow. Like I was like, <laughs> you know, the heart mo- almost coming out from the chest, <laughs> literally. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of <laughs> well. It's it's very very unique unique experience. And but yeah, I say. You know, like sleeping in a monastery is not comfortable because the whole monastery is made from mud. So it's very traditional. There are some new buildings, but the whole, but most of the buildings there is made from mud. And it's kind of cold at night. But the moment I woke up in the early morning, I will tell you, I'll, I can describe again. You know, you just push the door open, you walk out, you will see the Snow Cave Mountains surround you. And then you can see that those houses are overlapping on each other there's the staircases okay so you just walk down the route and you can hear the monks chanting in the background Dude, i'm getting i'm getting it's chills so just hearing you talk about it it's my dream to go to i've never been to like tibet or you know that area nepal uh, up in the hills and I've, i really really want to do that um so Yes, just, yes, and then the yes. stars, it's, you have it's, all the stars so above unique. you. It just must be like absolutely incredible. It's insane. It's insane. Yeah, it's insane. It's kind of fun. It's fun and it's insane. Especially, yeah, the place that you want to use like VDMN to get a shot. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy because you need to make sure that the area has zero light pollution and the weather has to be clear. And the the, the the period of time that you can do the shooting is very short because VTMN is a very tight composition. If you miss like maybe an hour late or uh, you know the Mickey Mouse will just out from the composition or maybe half partly out from the composition and you miss. You know, the first night we were, we were lucky enough to get a shot. So we went back for the second night. Uh you know it was cloudy but you know it's fine. So yeah. Then we try to shoot the monks. That's there. a good point. When is a the a good time of year to to go? Because not only do you need to be there when the Milky Way is out, and you know when the moon when there's no moon or a new moon or whatever. Also, you need to make sure that the weather, because you're up in the mountains. How do, is there a good time to go? Like, what did you or did you just go when the Milky Way was in the right position that you wanted, or how did you? What would you recommend for somebody wanting to okay, plan this uh, trip? What time of year is the best time to go? Usually, I would say that somewhere in May, June, July is the best. But you can start it. You can start to catch a Milky Way, you know, like this month, you know. But it's just very, February. very. Uh, in Malaysia, it's very, very close to the sunrise. So it means that you may have like maybe an hour shooting time, then the sunrise, then blue hour, then you won't be able to continue shoot to shoot. But May, June, and July, you have almost the whole night. You know, the Milky Way will be out there in, in the sky for the whole night. Okay? So that's why you have a longer shooting time. And you will have a higher chance in get the shots. Maybe you cannot get a shot in this angle, but you may get a Milky Way in another angle. So let's... Yeah. But... If you stay awake for the whole night, 
<laughs> yeah. You know, you have to wait for like few hours so that you know this this two hours this angle you cannot get and make until you wait until Mickey Way go move into another angle when the weather is clear, then you shoot. Yes. So let's yes. let's talk a little bit about your kind of creative process or thought process and kind of what you do to, to capture these shots. And the first shot I want to talk about is the um, shot of the, uh, you have like a Milky Way pano with um, a Buddha, yeah. the Buddha. So can you, oh, yeah. uh, first off, love this shot, the Buddha. I mean, first just putting, you know, the Buddha there just right away makes it so mystical. But then having the Milky Way and the universe behind it just adds a whole nother dimension to it. And you have the full band of the Milky Way, the Milky Way arch. So can you kind of yeah. talk me through your creative process of, of what went through your head when you were capturing this shot in terms of like composition, composition, well, gear, settings, etc.? For that, actually, you know, I saw someone do that. <laughs> before so i know that what i can get i'm very mm -hmm. honest with that okay uh but there are some time that i try to use the same technique in different situation okay so because i know that yes i can capture the panel then in another place i can also do the panorama for the milky way which i apply that in mount bromo in other places in also key monastery so that's the thing that you know i i'm a person that I like to plan uh you know i'm not that kind of person that I just go here and see, go there and just see whether I might be lucky enough. Because I don't really buy that kind of like, you know, oh, I was being lucky to get a shot. You know, the plane just fly by. <laughs> okay, I'm not that kind of person. I like to play my shot. I like to fully utilize my time because, you know, uh, you know, we are not a full-time photographer. So we don't really have so much time to stay in a, in a day, in a place for like a month or maybe two months which we can, you know, just take our own sweet time. So we want to make sure of that. So that's why I like to plan. I would like to plan that this time, what I can get. If I can't get here, you know, if I can't get a shot here, I have another backup shot. So I already plan that, you know, like, I already study very well. I know that, let's say Mikiwe at this time, I can shoot this. If Mikiwe move into another angle, I can shoot that. You know, if let's say uh, I got that, I can shoot Star Trek. So I already have these kind of things that I already know how to shoot. And I even know how to shoot time lags. So when you say, when you're yeah. planning, are you talking about research as in um, searching sites to find, you know, what, what photos you could capture there? Or are you talking about using an app like Photo Pills to, to see the actual location? Can you walk me through your planning process? What sites do you use? What apps do you uh, use? Yep, yeah, sure. Sure. It will be it will be all, all of them, the things that you mentioned. Okay. So for example, first I will try to find some reference just to give me a better idea of the place. Second, I need to check the light pollution if you want to photograph the Milky Way. So whether it's the place that is good enough for light pollution. Because I will also do some searching for the reference for like, you know, Milky Way in a certain place. For example, you want to go to Japan, you want to know whether you can get a Milky Way. Japan Milky Way, that's the keyword. So you know Google is always is, is Google right. your main research um platform? Do you no, have just, Instagram, just small Facebook, five hundred PX or do you have like a your main thing that you <laughs> uh, Google would be the main. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, because there are so many superimposed shots. I'm not against that, you know, sometimes do it too. You mean, you mean like a, <laughs> you have to double check to make You mean a composite shot. So yeah, it's but, not, you mean that you're talking about a yeah, composite yeah. shot, which isn't real. Because, yeah, sometimes you see like, oh, there's the, the Milky Way over Mount Fuji. It's, it's an arch or something. And it's just impossible because it just never lines up. Actually, I don't know if that's the case for that. But there are some photos that people are just making. And then you get there and you're like, oh, that's actually not possible. Yeah, you saw some very famous photo, but it's really not possible. So we don't want to, you know, you know, after I've traveled like three days to a place and get handy and de handed, uh, I don't want that. So I will always double check the, the light pollution. Okay, so I found some reference. Which site do you the use? Light Dark Light Finder? Uh, yeah, that's one, one of them. Dark Sky, Dark, you know, I think one is called Dark Sky Finder. Uh, you just search for like the mm -hmm. sky fighter you have a few any one of them will work okay then second I will check on the directions Where, how do you direction which is 
Google Map. Mm -hmm. Google Map, you find a place, and you know from the place that Google Map uh, top is the north, it will also face north in the top. Then let's say your subject is here, then you know that this is north, and Milky Way usually rise from the east direction. So you just know that, is it facing east? So is there any obstacle in between? So, and for some places, you can even click on the Google Street View to double verify. There's no Google Street View so in the like, Speedy Valley though, right? There's one, oh, really? there's one, but it's for, for another angle. There's one for the Satya angle and so, Sunset angle. Question, you're up in the mountains and the angle is pretty extreme because you have these high mountains in front of you. How do you know that the, the Milky Way will not be below the mountain range or, or whatnot? So like, let's say that the Buddha photo uh, with the arch, how do you know? Because it looks like you're looking kind of up and there's like the hills behind it. How do you know that the, the Milky Way is going to be at the height above the tallest mountain or whatever behind you? You can also search for the photo of the Buddha statue. They will have plenty of photo, although may not, most of them may not have Milky Way at the back there. Okay, but you can use that as a reference and you just use the direction on the Google Map to match it. So you know that this angle, uh, people, sometimes people travel to that, maybe from no photographer, you know, the locker, they post something about that, but at least he give me a better idea on how the place is. Then I can see that, oh, we, it's possible to catch a Milky Way. Of course, when we arrive at that place that time, I try to uh, be there earlier, so they have like few hours, you know, then I can just scout out the place just to double confirm uh, my investigations. And it also helped me to explore whether is there any other potential anger. Because let's say I was, if, I, if, if I'm wrong, at least I can just try different angle, find a different composition. So I still manage to get a shot. Okay, if let's say there's some things, you know, sometimes things like this can also happen. Oh, like for example, uh, let's say the Buddha statue is there for four years, but then the moment you arrive that time, for example, it's under construction. <laughs> Maybe someone is just right. repairing it. It's no, possible, that you won't know. Everywhere. Right. You In won't the know. Cities, yeah. Then you have to think about like what I can shoot. If I can't shoot the Buddha statue, can I shoot the village? Can I find some unique houses? Or um, if not, then maybe I will be like the subject myself. Okay, maybe if I go well here, I myself be the subject. So this is something that we're able to... You know, sometimes I don't believe like luck, you know, like oh, the weather is bad, I can't get any shots. You know, yes, that's one of the... Uh, you know, that can be one of the important factors to get a good photo. But that's not one of the important factors that you won't be able to get any shots. We were still able to work out some A lot things. of times we have the idea okay. of a shot in our head. You plan it, but you go there and you end up getting something different than what you had planned. Or it's, an, it's a kind of variation on what you planned. And that oftentimes ends up being the, you know, your favorite shot, at least for me, more so than the one that I had planned. But if you didn't have the plan to begin with yes. and you weren't there, then you wouldn't even have that other shot. Exactly, exactly. And and also depending on when I plan my trip, for example, let's say it's a short trip, uh, I will usually like prioritize certain location. It's like, uh, in a Malaysian way of saying, it's like, I die, die, also want to get that shot. Say again? What? I mean that it's a much, I die, die, you know, in a Malaysian die. way of saying, I die, I die, die, die. I mean that it's like, even, even I die, I also want to get right. that kind of shot. So it's a must right. get shot, okay? So it's a must get and something this up, then the other shot is like good to have. Right. Okay, so I have this kind of like paradise. So for example, if I go into New Zealand, I was like Church of the Good Shaper is something that must be on my list. So I will like, if let's say today I can't get, I will spare for another one two day, two night, two days there. Then I will just adjust my other itinerary. I will skip some. So sometimes I can make this kind of adjustment. If I go there by myself, I can make this kind of adjustment. If I get a tour, then I can also try to talk to tour, uh, depending on, you know, whether have you pay the booking fee to the, to the other places, the competition in other places. Okay, but usually I will make this kind of arrangement so that I can have a better chance in getting the shots. Okay, but of course, you know, in the end, it's still up to the mother nature <laughs> to decide whether you get it or not. Okay, if you're really unlucky, you know, sometimes it's really hard to say, but at least you try. And so far, I'm still, I'm able, 
I think I'm lucky enough so far I don't really have any shot that I didn't get. Although the weather may not be that great, but I still managed right. to get something. So can you, uh, yeah. so next up, your um, thought process behind your, uh, the gear that you use to capture this uh, Buddha um, arch, Milky Way arch shot. What gear were you using? Lens, camera, and so on. I was using, uh, that one is the Nikon D750. Mm -hmm. And plus a 40mm, 24mm f2.8 Nikon lens. So that's the wide angle lens because if you want to catch a Milky Way, uh, the easy way to catch a Milky Way is to use a wide angle because you're able to absorb more light of because due to the wider focal length. And at the same time, this wide angle lens also comes with a wide aperture f2.8, which allows me to you know get a brighter exposure without boosting up my ISO too much. But I'm going to be very honest with you. Even with that, I also often push my ISO to, you know, it's kind of often for me to use like ISO 25,600, 12,800, or even 8,000. It's very, very common for me to use such, you know, extreme ISO. Okay, but I can do that because I'm very confident with my gear. I know how to shoot it with a, with a, with lesser noise by using like, you know, ETTR technique. That's one of the way. And second, I try out, I know how to perform noise deductions. So the things about this is like what give confidence to a photographer, you know, compared to like, you know, if you are new to this, you don't know, because we are done a lot of experiment to check out you know, like, to what extent our camera can go. Right. I, so go if ahead, you, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if you pass me my, you know, D7 file, I know that this kind of thing, this kind of noise level, i able to handle. So how should I reduce noise? I know that i able to handle. Okay, if for other gears, then you have to try out your gears limitation to know that, oh, at certain ISO, maybe you won't be able to re reduce the noise to a level that you will be you feel that is considered acceptable for the kind of image quality so you still have to make the judgment I, when i started yeah. out in photography i always wanted to know you know well what are the settings what are the settings and i think even some advanced beginner or even intermediate photographers still we kind of want to know like what's the you know what's the right setting to do but really as you progress you the best thing that you can do is really use your gear and learn what your camera is capable of doing and, and how far you can push it. Exactly. And that's really the, exactly. the key because, of course, there is a kind of baseline, like a place where you want to start. But after that, it's really what can your camera do? And then also, what are you willing to accept? You know, what's the limit that you're yes, willing yes, to accept? Yes. Yes. In yes, terms yes, of noise yes, exactly. or, or, or um, blurriness or, yeah, or whatever. For some people, they say that they don't mind. You know, I'm, I just post this on social exactly. media, which to be honest, right, is fine right. for me. It's, it's your shot. Right. It's your photography. For me, I like to print out. So I'm, uh, I'm more focused on the noise. I'm more focused on the image and some quality. People don't, but right. that's and some choice. people don't even notice that though. Like for us, usually the, the photographer, when they look, they're like, oh my God, look at it. It's like it's slightly blurry in the right corner or look at the noise on the eye of the Buddha in the right corner. You know, I can't share this, you know, whereas most people, they look at it yeah, and they're yeah, just, yeah. they would never see it. You know, that kind of like the average viewer, let's say, not the, the photographer viewer. Yes, or, yes, 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 yes. But, but if you have these kind of things, you, you, you should know how to, handle and how to avoid this kind right. of mistake you know as a professional photographer because things like this can be very fatal to us especially after we spend so much you know money so much effort and time to go there and it's not easy that sometimes the weather is may not be on your side but when the weather is you know just nice that time you have to be ready to get a shot you know you won't know that whether will it be cloudy in the next few minutes so you have to immediately get a shot and you have to plan your shooting. You have to be able to handle that. That's why, like, you know, sometimes by knowing your camera limitation, by knowing, uh, you know, post-processing, it helps because you know that how you're able to shoot and able to to make a good use of the limit of the time that you have to take the shot.
for example, if let's say, uh, you know, when the weather is, you know, when I when the weather is clear, maybe I just got a Milky Way for like five minutes, and then I will just shook the Milky Way, same composition, but I can just ignore the foreground. Maybe someone is in front of my foreground, but I don't care. I just sketch it first. Okay. Then after the person left, you know, I just I just take another extra shot for the foreground. Then I just planning. It's the same composition, but you know, just for me to to deal with the situation in a more effective and faster way so I can shoot it instead of sometimes people trying to argue or crowd with each other, you know, asking people move move away. You know, it's it's kind of, it's it's very common. It's very common in in astrophotography. It often happens like people shooting at each other. Uh yeah. So these kinds of things happen. But you know, so we know how to handle this kind of situation. And uh, you also have to like shoot when there's you know, a lot of crowds. Like just for the good shaper. You know, it's insane. <laughs> the number of people there is really insane. But you need to know how to tender that, how to get a clean image. So when you're yeah. shooting this, um, you're not using a star tracker. You are taking multiple exposures and then blending the, the multiple exposures. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, usually I did that. Usually I did that. Uh, uh, multiple exposure, if let's say there's a need for the foreground. For example, the foreground maybe like monastery because they have the lights on, so I would do a bracketing, and then so that I can just recover all the overexposed highlight. But the but then for some situation that, uh, you know, if I can get everything in one single shot, I don't really need to use uh bracketing. Like say this is just like a tooth, and you know, technique is like one way for you to expand, and be able to shoot in different kind of situations. So how, yeah, how about the Buddha shot? Did um can you walk us through um how you shot it i mean the, the actual it's a single shot how many how many photos were there on the panel well, do you remember two three four should be five or okay. six five and that's six. a portrait shoot portrait white. orientation not landscape obviously no it's a landscape orientation it's kind oh, of really? interesting okay. it's kind of interesting because yeah because usually for like for panorama we shoot in portrait okay because Usually that is when the Milky Way is high above the the ground and should portray so that you can able to include both the Milky Way and the foreground. But for this thing, it's like one of those kind of things that you know that's the only thing that I have using the landscape orientation because that, uh, I was shooting very wide because I was very close to the Buddha statue and I was actually kneeling on the slope in front of the Buddha statue, okay? So me and my friend was kneeling there, okay? And uh, it's kind of scary, uh, you know, and then we try to shoot. So that's why there's a one way is that one is that if you want to wait for the Milky Way to get higher and shoot using a portrait mode, portrait orientation, it won't be possible because we are too close to the Buddha statue. There's no more room for us to step back. So if we move back, we're going to fall from the from the from the slope, <laughs> okay? And yeah, <laughs> that that kind of situation is kind of funny. And so we shoot wide, and we just shoot landscape oriented, okay? So that the Milky Way actually is quite close to the horizon, okay? Quite close to the horizon, but we manage to get the whole shot, which is just in line with the Buddha structure, and it look kind of nice too. So when you yeah. say so, it's four photos, uh, four tile. I think five? five. I think four or five. Yeah, yeah. So it's five like it two, yeah. two or three on top, and then two or three. No, no, it's just one, two, three, four, five. But you know, I will, I will lap in each other, uh, like oh. at least more than one, one, one third of the frame, so that I can just you know, if I make any mistake, I can just trying to, I can, I want to be safe to be able to merge it, because during the shooting that time, I can't, <laughs> I can't see the so result. I so I have to try out. Just to yeah. confirm what you're saying then, I think I understand now is you were so close to the Buddha statue that a landscape oriented shot was enough to get everything from the bottom of the frame of the Buddha to the top of yes. where the Milky Way was. There was no yes. need to go into yes. portrait. Then it would have been just too much, yes. you know, dead space on the top and bottom of the image. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. So you... Take your uh, tiled photo, and then you your workflow, your editing process. Are you um, 
merging these in Lightroom or Photoshop to merge the panel? Which or do you use PT PT GUI PT uh, GUI or whatever? I didn't use PT GUI. PT GUI is for some you know like uh, if you are more into serious uh, commercial shot like properties uh, interior. Uh, those you will require PT GUI, but for this kind of like, this kind of like shooting, because you know there's only one structure. Okay, of course we have distortion, but I managed to fix it using Photoshop. PT GUI would be better to handle distortion if you have a proper panoramic head, head, uh, you know, ball head that would also be better to handle all this kind of distortion and parallax. But for my case, there yeah, because you know even though it's distorted, you won't be able to tell that whether the mountain is distorted, whether a hill is dis distorted. Okay, so because the only thing that I need to fix is the Buddha statue, so I do I do I did something you know on Photoshop to correct it, and also perform some noise reduction. So, uh, on the Buddha statue, you use yeah. so you uh, make the panel in Lightroom, then export to Photoshop, yes. and then you're doing like a warp or something to just e even yes, everything yes, out. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yeah. Um, one one thing about gear, something you just mentioned, um, the I forgot what it's called, the panel. Well, you talked about using a panel ball head. Panoramic. But the um, what's the yeah. piece of gear I forgot that moves the um, the, uh, the leveling. Yeah, base, not the I leveling think, base. Like there's that. a plate. It's a it's a panel plate. Do they call it a panel plate? It's like you can so that way your your the middle point of your lens yeah. is over the middle yeah. of the. The track, I think they call it a track, I, track plate. I don't know. I can't I remember the thing. Pan pan I, don't I don't use one, and I've managed. I guess it, they say it's only really necessary if the your foreground is really close to you. Then you get the parallax effect where everything's and off. But if you're a distance from what you're shooting, yes. they say it's not so necessary. Well, anyways, it's interesting that you're not using yes. one, and you can still get a great image without it. At least they're doing what you do. Yeah, for that, and you know, I I have I oh. I bought one before, but now I really uh, now they I rarely use it because especially when traveling, it's just too heavy to mm. carry around. <laughs> especially to this kind of like you know like Spiti Valley, sometimes you may need to walk and you just become, you need to you know, keep your, you know, camera gears light, so that's why it's easier for you to just walk around on these kind of places. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I. I I think I didn't bring I didn't bring that to the tree or even I bring it I just leave it in the in the luggage. All right, I yeah. I didn't expect that we would talk that long about that one photo. I want to jump on to it, but it's um oh, thank yeah. you for for sharing that. It's very interesting how you captured that. Um just moving on to our next uh topic. The next place I want to talk about is uh Mount Bromo. Uh, shooting in Mount Bromo. Oh, yeah. So th your first shot here, you have the uh, Mount Bromo with the star trails and then the, the light yes. below. Love that shot. Can you tell us a little bit about that shot, how you captured it, especially the, the light trails? How did you get the light trails with the lights to all kind of merge into one thing, one one shot? Okay. Uh, the whole photo was shoot, um, you know, like, okay, this is very interesting because... Uh, you know, I've been shooting Astro Milky Way for and Star Trails for many years. So sometimes I try to get the most out from my shooting. So what I usually de do is that I will shoot time lapse. Okay, I shoot time lapse, and then I can take one still image for maybe Milky Way. I can take a group of image for the Star Trails. So that's what I did for this same shooting, but. The shooting is around uh, around the same, but uh around the same. So what I did is that you know let's focus on start here. So for start here, I always aim for hundred shots, although I may not need I may not be able to get hundred shots or I may not need to use hundred shots. But that is something that I try to aim for catching more, instead of lesser. Okay, so it's how good far, to have more. How far you know? spaced out is each exposure? Um, I think. Let me try to recall. Around 20, oh, 25 it. seconds, okay. I should like 10 legs. So yeah. that's about and then, and then, and then, 50 and then minutes, one hour, this will be one like, hour of time lapse, more or less. If, for, if we just talk, for the whole time lapse, oh. I shoot for two hours, one, one hour, half okay. of two hours. Okay, usually for the nice guy. Okay, uh, because uh, that will be more on time lapse. But for, for Star Trek only, 
I try to aim for 100 shots, you know, so which means that for two hour time lags, I will take, you know, only 100 shots from there. So which for the start here, for start here, I try to aim for around 40 or 45 minutes. Okay, because I think that's, you get a long enough start trails, which create a better looking, you know, better effect. Some people shoot like 20 minutes for me, it's just two shots, two shots for it. Uh, yeah, so that's what I always try to aim for. I've okay. seen um, that there's, so there's two ways you can create star trails from what I know. One is like the way you're saying, which is a long, ex you know, a, a time lapse over say an hour or actually there's a few ways. So you can either do one exposure and just keep the shutter open for 50 minutes. You're laughing. I'll ask you about that in a second. So one is uh, the, the one single long exposure. <laughs> second option is to take uh, many exposures and then blend them together, which is the method you use. And then I've seen another one, which is kind of like a hack uh, in Photoshop. You take one, one shot, way. and then you kind of, war I can't remember what it was. Yeah, it like rotates it. Well, they call it like vortex effect. Yeah, or effect, vortex effect or something. So you don't need to wait one hour or two hours or three hours. You can, or if you didn't do that, you can just take one shot and, you know, spin it around and it like extends the edge of the, the star trails. Uh, out of those three methods, you you choose the the second one, the multiple exposure. Do you have any thoughts on the yeah. the first method? Obviously, you were laughing about it, or the or the last one. What do you think about the those? Okay, the first one. Um, it's possible to shoot that, uh, but I would say at your own risk, <laughs> because you're going to open up the shutter. You know, you're going to do like the long exposure for like half an hour, let's say half an hour. So you're going to build up a lot of heat to A lot sensor. of heat on the sensor. It may, yeah, it may burn or damage okay. the sensor. Okay, you can try that. I believe that nowadays the camera is more durable compared to last time, but you know, your choice. I done that before, you know, last time using, go. I went for 15 minute shot, uh, single shot using my old camera, old cross sensor camera before I sunk <laughs> it into a sea. <laughs> okay, so that was the cross sensor camera. So uh, yeah, so but you know, after that I got a full frame camera, I I not there to do that anymore. First I would say that there's risk there's a risk risk to damage your camera. Okay. This statement has been there for decades. Okay. Although I don't know how it works applied to the current modern camera you can try out and let me okay. know <laughs> okay i wish i want to know but i know that to try i know that to test because I, I i don't want to damage my camera uh even though it may or may not to the current modern cameras okay especially to the mirrors okay but no, don't, i'm not there to do that okay so and there's another things that you need to consider i prefer the second methods because you should multiple exposure you should multiple exposure your foreground maybe only come from one shot. So what does that mean? Okay, the start trail you need the whole series of photo. So, but then uh, for the foreground you maybe came from one shot because it's the same foreground. Okay, unless your foreground have light has light trails and it's different things. Okay, but let's say your foreground only have one shot, and for example, if you do it for one single shot, twenty minutes, let's say half an hour, we stick back to half half an hour. So and then. You took the photo, you take the photo, and time passed. You start to press after time passed for like 29 minutes. So one minute to go. And one of your friend turn on the light. <laughs> yeah, their headlamp. Their headlamp hits your lens or something. Yeah, the, the headlamp. Or a car drives through. Or, you know, there's through. a vehicle passing by. Yeah. Right. You know? Things is or very common also for planes. things like that. Uh, another one is if you have a lot of planes Tourists. over the area. You know, you have the light trails from the planes yeah, uh, sometimes. Yeah, it's going to overexpose. Uh, you're going to ruin your shot, overexpose. You know, some photographer, you know, maybe they just arrive. They also need the headlamp, you know, a flashlight to to light up the place so that they can see the yeah where they are they will, they will be walking on. So you know, you can't really blame them. Okay, people current. I really heard about story that people photographer color because of this kind of situations okay so you know if you shoot multiple exposures 
you know, multiple frame. Okay, not same exposure, but multiple shots. Uh, you know, it's okay. You know, it's like I have hundred shots. You only ruin one or two shots, maybe three shots. I still have, you know, ninety shots plus plus for me to use for my foreground. Okay, so it's fine for me. So the the risk is a lot lower. Okay, the risk is a lot lower. So the first one, the risk is definitely higher. So I may say that first, you may damage your camera. Second, uh, you need to make sure that the whole environment, you know, there's no interactions. Okay, so the third one is a easy Photoshop hack. So the same things that I have is the same thought I have for for sky replacement. For me, I always try. I enjoy trying to get everything right from my camera okay but i don't use those you know those extra technique you know as something that sometimes I want to be more creative for example some places that i cannot get a milky way or some places that i cannot get star trail maybe i'll do this kind of places just for fun or maybe i use this as the last resort you know the last solutions that i have if let's say i, I went to a place and then i try to capture a shot that I must get, but I can't get. I mean, the a sky replacement, <laughs> okay. And I have to leave. I cannot stay. I may do a sky sky replacement, but of course, no matter how, I was try to plan everything. You know, after you've spent so much effort in planning, when they when you're able to get a shot at time, that kind of fulfillment, satisfaction is. I would say that's something you can't what, really What describe. about it is satisfying yeah. for you? Because I know some people, they say, like, if you tell them everything you do to get the shot, and they're like, well, why not just Photoshop in the sky? Or why not, you know, why not just add in the sky? Or why not just do whatever? So why wait all that time? Why do all that? I mean, what is the joy for you? Or what is the, the thing that you like about trying to get it, let's say, naturally or in camera or as it appears in, in front of your eye? What is the... I think it's really depending on people, you know, I'm I'm okay for people in that way, you know, you know, that's their style. I'm not I'm not against that. Uh it it's just my style and I'm also a workshop instructor. I teach people and I often like to share. I like to share my raw files. <laughs> so you can see that I share a lot of before and after <laughs> all, all my Facebook. So it's and, a business you know, decision. An editor. No, no, it's I know, not just business decision. It's, it's what you like. It's like for right. for sharing. Yeah. I like to share. You know, like this is how you can get. But it's kind of funny. You like, um, you know, like recently I posted my video and man shot of Milky Way on Twitter. I have to state that it's already it's a real Milky Way. <laughs> you know, sometimes you know, you know, you don't date state that people think oh it's like it's a composite shot, yeah. So and um, like my butter cave, the pigeons, they are all real. They are real pigeons. Yes, but it's just some points that people think that it's fake. Because why it's real? Because I really spent time to explore the place and know I that. I was sitting next to you. I was sitting to next it. to you when you took the shot, so yes. I can vouch for yeah. you that it's real. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people question that. What, what is is it real? I say yes, yes, yes. I bring the, the pigeon myself. No, no, it's from there. <laughs> Okay. So speaking yeah. of composites, though, um, you obviously can't capture these star trails. Well, you could technically, if everything worked out, maybe capture it in a single exposure with the star trails and the, the foreground. But in this case, yeah. you're doing multiple exposures. So can you walk us through the second part of your image about uh, exposing for or, or capturing the foreground? Did you use the foreground shot that you used for the stars, or was that a separate shot? And then finally, how do you, um, you know, uh, merge these photos together or make create your composite? Okay, uh, it's the same shot. So for example, I got hundred shots. So and um, I will use a software like Star Trails, Star X, Stars Star Stacks, Stacker? Star, yeah, Star, Star Stacker, Star Stacks, yeah, S T A X X, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's the one. So, uh, you know, it's a free software. You can just find software like that, you know, on the internet. And you just merge that into the Star Trails, one single Star Trails shots. And then you just take the sky. Because when they do the merging together, the foreground may look very messy. Because they may have, like, flickering. 
because the exposure may change a little bit, you know, I don't know why. Uh, or maybe some bending, but you just use only the sky. So then we just open up the Photoshop. Uh, we import, you know, one of the shop that have has the clean foreground for the, you know, from the series back to the, into the Photoshop. Then we get import the star trails, the sky, for, into the Photoshop, and then we put them both together as one. Okay. Yeah. So this is how I do it. All right. Yeah. So last question about uh, Bromo. Um, do you have any thoughts or tips about going to Bromo or shooting there? Um, me personally, I, I went to Bromo. I went to shoot the Milky Way, partly inspired by the photos that I saw from you. And actually, before I went, I called you and Thanks. I was like, who, you know, who's your guide? Where did you stay? What's the place? Yeah. And I was asking you all these questions. I have to say that in Asia, uh, Bromo is hands down one of the most incredible places I've ever seen. Not just in Asia, yeah. in the world. And Yeah, and in I've never world, seen anything like it. Bromo, if you don't know, it's this huge uh, volcano. And yeah, volcano. and it's when you get yeah. to the top of the volcano, there's a massive crater. And then inside the crater, there's other mini, a, a couple mini volcanoes, and then another volcano beyond that. Yes. And these volcanoes are like semi active. Uh, there's no lava coming out, at least when I was there, but there is smoke coming out of them. And yes, yeah, and the, and the huge, and the whole environment is totally different. You know, they are like, Desert, it's you know, like you're on desert. Mars or something. Uh, like it's really it's exactly otherworldly. Exactly. It literally is otherworldly. Yes, especially like you know you you are just coming. You you know it's in Indonesia, which is another tropical yeah. city like Malaysia, and when you you know it's the same country where Bromo is, but when you enter the Bromo, it's like enter right. a totally different right. world. The whole and whole environment is so different because of the volcano, the volcanic environment, and they have horsemen, <laughs> plenty of them. They have you know people riding on the bike, travel around, and they dress and they use jeeps. So many jeeps, you know, at at the same place. It's so unique, it's so unique, it's so magical. You know, so any special. any tip for going there? When I went there, it was cloudy for the the three days that I was there. And I was just like, oh. Yeah, th I think you went there not at the right right yeah. month, right? Usually people went there like, like say May, mm -hmm. June, July. That usually yeah. is the peak. And I also recommend you go there during that time because you has, you will have a higher chance to get the Milky Way if right. you aim for the Milky Way. Yeah. So that what I usually say. Okay, now that I think traveling to Bromo is easier because last I heard there's a new expressway open up. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, because. After they open up, I never had a chance to go back there. Okay, so so the travel time should be shorter. Yeah. And, and uh, for those who don't know, uh, Bromo is in... Um, Surabaya is the city. What's the um, state? Java Jow Island. Java Jow Island. Island. So, yeah, it's a whole, the huge Jow And Jow right Island. next to that is Bali. So if you're in Bali or going to Bali, you could actually drive. There's some... I mean, if you rent a car... You, you have to take a boat, right? Well, you take drive to there, the ed, to the west you know? part of Bali, and then there's a ferry which will take you across. There's a little, yeah. you know, the ocean, whatever. But there's a ferry you could go across and then drive uh, from there. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's like a seven, eight hour drive or something, but it is possible to, or you could fly, um, yeah. But it's not too far. Yeah, if you have uh, enough time, you can slowly explore the whole, you know, like from. Not from Surabaya, maybe from what they, I can't remember the name. Uh, and outside of Surabaya, there's like, you know, the the, the Buddha mm -hmm. statue. Are oh, like yeah. Um, so many levels. I didn't go and I want to go. It's. Um, Boro Budo. Boro Budo. Boro Yeah, Boro Boro Budo. Boro Boro Budo. Yeah, there's bro, loads bro. of yeah, stuff. I, yeah. I love Indonesia. Like for landscapes, for me, Indonesia is like hands down has just these volcanoes, massive yes, waterfalls. Yes, yes, yes. Like it's just yes. well, these massive temples and yeah, everything fish. is just yeah. m mind blowing. Yes. Yeah. So you can go for like Bro Budo, Bromo, Ijen, uh, Ijen, Ijen, where you can yeah. see the blue fire right, with the sulfur, and then yeah. Bali. Loads of stuff. Yeah. 
There's also like Komodo Islands. It's endless. Yeah, many, many beautiful places there. Yeah, I want to explore more. Uh, let's see after the pandemic. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of my plans have been, yeah, have to postpone because of pandemic. We're saving yeah. the best for last. Malaysia. Malaysia Bole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Malaysia Bole. So, yeah. <laughs> um, shooting the Milky Way in Malaysia. If somebody's flying to Malaysia, uh, what would be your, if you could say like one place, like the epic best place in Malaysia? Do you have a... Would it be Kinabalu? Sabah is very beautiful, to be honest. Mount Kinabalu, Sabah, they have a lot of islands and beaches, uh, which is very, very beautiful. Uh, Sabah, they also have one of the floating moles, uh, which I think is also very beautiful, which is in Kota Kinabalu. I think that would be a, mm-hmm. a good place. But in terms, okay, of, um, uh, in terms of astrophotography, that, what would you say are like the, the main places you know if somebody's uh, you know a tourist in malaysia and, and somebody asks you hey i want to shoot the milky way in malaysia where should i go what would you tell them i think camera, camera highland yeah. camera highland i recommend camera highland uh because why you know you know if you talk about if you really want to enjoy you know like typical malaysia stuff because you go to Sabah, Sabah is another side of Malaysia. It's East Malaysia. We have West Malaysia. Because if you want to go come to the capital, which is Kuala Lumpur, here, and you can shoot, you know, our Petronas Twin Towers. We have a few new high-rise, new sky, skyscrapers uh, here, so which you can shoot also. And you can dry the food here. Malaysia is always about food. And then you can travel from... Kuala Lumpur to Cameron Highland, which is around three and a half hour or four and a half hour, depending how fast you drive. <laughs> which is also the <laughs> world's most adventurous road, I think. <laughs> no, no, no. This one Going is, up into the nothing, hills, that curvy road. I, I took a bus down there yeah. and I, I was like, my knuckles were white. I was holding on because the bus drivers like whip up and down there so fast. And I was just like praying as I was coming uh, down that I was going to make it. I think I could even smell some alcohol on his breath. But anyways, that's another story. Um, <laughs> the, the, one thing, um, the one thing with um, the highlands there is the weather. It's cloudy quite a bit. And so I was there with you. I remember uh, one time we went to shoot and there were yes. like a lot of clouds. But I think if you're shooting in Malaysia don't be discouraged by the clouds because often they, they break. And so I think a lot of times it's like yes. you're waiting for the Milky Way. It's like cloudy, 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 and then nothing for like five minutes, maybe 10, 20 minutes, and then cloudy yeah, again. But- so you really have to just kind of sit and wait and be patient. Yeah. But when it opens up, all you need is, you yes, know, exactly. a, f- a few minutes of, of cloudy skies. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, what comes to worst you also have a right. good sunrise. That's the other thing too, right? I would say, I would say, you know, if let's say, you know, Cameron Highland is famous for sunrise, okay? Uh, you know, if you can get Milky Way, that would be great. If you can't, you can also get a good sunrise. Why? I often say that it's kind of funny. If the weather is cloudy at night, you may not be able to get a Milky Way, but you may be able to get a good sunrise because you need some clouds, you know, for the colors. We call it like burn, burn on the cloud, the burning clouds, okay? So, and... Um, <coughs> If you get a Milky Way, the sky the sky is clear, but when for, during the sunrise the time, you know it's just, you know, may get a decent sunrise, you know, but there's not going to have clouds with the color to fill out the sky, you know, you have some colors but you know not as dramatic with the clouds, yeah. So it's like give and take. Okay, sometimes you may be able to be that lucky to get both, but chances is like most likely not. And yeah. For anybody who's wondering, if you do go there, probably the most popular spot is a place called uh, Bo Tea Plantation. B O H. Plantation. So I palace. Yeah, Bo, Bo Tea Plantation. Yeah, yeah, they have tea. a nice little cafeteria too. You can get a coffee or a tea. Actually, you don't want to drink coffee there. You got to drink a yeah. tea. Uh, but they have teas and they have yes, scones yes, yes. as well. I remember yes. that. That's a big thing. The British, the, yeah, the scones. Scone. It's beautiful. The the Bo Pl- uh, Tea Plantation is the place to to check out. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yes, that's why uh, one of my favorite places in Malaysia. Uh, often visit 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 there. Um, you know, like 
last time like one year like a few times <laughs> when I'm there uh, for photo shooting you know sunrise what yeah. about um, ter- ter- your hometown is ter- Teranganu right on east T- east Terengganu, Malaysia yes it's the east coast and you have a photo I remember yeah, one I think that you took the boat photo from there there's like an old boat sitting on the yeah that's your hometown yeah, right yeah an old boat embedded boat yeah, mm. yeah 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 but the boat you know it's a broken boat and now it's totally broken <laughs> it's done it's gone yeah, yeah. Not be- not mm-hmm. not me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because I got the shot, then I just I don't want to let anyone take the shot. No, no, it's not me. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's it's a nice play. It's a nice play. Uh, it has some. Uh, you know, like minor light pollution, but you can still get the Milky Way. Okay. Okay. So at that kind of places, you may need to spend more talk about picking your foreground because, like I say, the clarity of the sky won't be as good as zero light pollution. Okay, then you must have to think of how to get a good foreground, so to 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 make a good photo. So for example, like the boat that you mentioned is an abandoned boat, but the problem when shooting something like abandoned is that there's no lights. Do you ever do light painting? No just lights. take your headlamp or something and just kind of light it up a little bit. Yeah, but it's not easy to get a very right. natural look. Uh, you know, like you want to paint it in a very even way. Make sure every place got painted properly and it take a few try okay someone shared a take piece for with me uh but i never had a chance to try which means that you have to do the light painting not from the front you have to go for like you know like portrait you have to go from the side light maybe 45 degree and you just light up from there then that would be better okay but i try to get everything natural so for the broken book you know i was hanging you know uh a candle lamp you know, using those kind of like candle. So it's just a small one just to light it up to make it more interesting. Okay. So same for like abandoned, abandoned, you know, like hut or abandoned house. I will try to light up. Okay. Using a flashlight to light up, you know, inside it. Then just to make it like glowing at night, which make it more interesting because you, you, do, you want to have a, you know, when we photograph in Mikiwe, it's not just about Mikiwe. Foreground is also very important. Because if you can have a good foreground plus a good Milky Way, then that creates something more aw- awesome. Yeah, having yeah. the foreground also helps tell a story. It gives a sense of place if you're in a exactly. location. So, for example, you're a Terragano shot. Exactly. You have the palm trees as well, which shows like this is a tropical yes, yeah. area. Kimonos and then three. we don't see yeah. the water, but we see the boat, which is kind of like by the water and then you know oh, that's exactly. an old boat and it's an abandoned boat and it kind of just adds something exactly. more rather than just having the milky way shot yep. uh, so what you're saying is rather than light painting from outside you know holding flashing a light on something or whatever you like to put a light inside um like the the building or or maybe even a boat or whatever to light it from yes. the inside yes so okay great yes, great. yes. oh and do you use uh, any type of light for that i remember you have a those square little LED panel, battery-powered LED panel light? Is that you? Oh, no, I know okay. you said that was just just, just too okay. strong, too overpowered. Okay, so I use, like, you know, normal, the small mm-hmm. flashlight. Uh, then I will just wrap it with a, with a plastic huh. bag just to reduce okay. the, 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 right. uh, the power so that it won't be too strong that, you know, you don't want to just, like, light out in some places, some places just overexposed. You want the light get diffused. Right. Okay, at the same time, because you wrap it with a plastic bag, for example, like orange right. plastic bag, it helps to create a warmer yep. tone. So the warmer tone to light out the foreground would be better too. Mm. Okay, so that's one, yeah, that depending on, yeah, that's one way I, I'll, I'll use that. If I want to do light painting, I've done that before, but, you know, I like to use, if light up the inside of the building or the boat, uh, it really depends. Sometimes I just use a remote flash, flash gun. I use a flash gun to light up. Yeah, because, you know, light up interior, mm-hmm. that one is, let's say, blue color mm-hmm. is fine. You know, like the house, we have blue light, yeah. that, which is fine. It matches the, the tone. Yeah, but for nature thing, uh, you can't really do that. If you want to do light painting, then you have to use a flashlight. You wrap it with, uh, they have some, you know, they, sometimes they come with those color gel. But if you, I don't really think that you need to buy a color gel. You just find some okay. orange plastic. M- maybe for me, it's easy to get that. Just wrap it. And just then, find some yeah. trash on the side it of the looks, road. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Save your money. Uh, yeah. All right. So I want to kind of change gears here and uh, move on to a couple little topics, uh, if you have time. Um, yep. 
so sure. right before we started, uh, right before we went live here, I was we were talking about two things. Uh, one was NFTs, and the other was uh, yeah. Twitter, and how Twitter, you know, how yes. you're finding more engagement on Twitter, and also you're experimenting with NFTs. Uh, which one do you do you want to talk about first? Which one do you think would lead into the other better? Okay. NFT first, because so NFTs, man. What's yeah, okay. what's the uh, deal? Uh, everybody, you know, I think a lot of us are, you know, everybody hears about it, and the kind of the general thing I hear is. I don't know what NFTs okay, just, are, yeah, but what, what uh, I feel like I should be doing it. And I think there's also this kind of almost fear of missing out. Like, you know, oh, well, other people are doing it. Other people it's are, not, you know, whatever. So I, I think, uh, I guess my first question for you is, you know, maybe what is an NFT and then how it, what's your experience been? I know you're just kind of uh, dipping your toes into it. You're just getting started. What, what have you learned so far? Okay. In a simple way to say, every photographer and artist get into <laughs> NFT. Everybody do it, okay. hands down. That's a, hands down. Yeah, yes, you yes. Sound, okay, okay, you're okay. you're a believer. Okay. You're you're no. we say in America we say you're drinking yeah. the Kool-Aid and yeah. you you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but but you know actually I've done a little bit of study and I found that this thing is huge. Huge because it's not just about photography. It's not just about, um, about artist, okay, or about investor or collector, okay. Because it has a huge potential. Because for example, like people buying land, virtual land, how can you justify that this virtual land is genuine, or it's like it's tied to someone? That's because of NFT. So same for photography. So how can it protect your value? Because Let's be honest. Photographers has been underpaid, uh, for for decades. Okay, last time photographer will have a better pay, you know, like on print, but once you go online, digital, you know, like digital copy, it doesn't mean anything. What you can sell is on stock photo, which is going to pay you for very very less, less than a dollar, you know, per download. Okay, so um. But NFT is like how you sell a print, okay? Because why you sell a print, you can sell at a higher price. Because when you say that this is a limited edition, in the whole world only one exit, that's the print, so you can sell it as at a higher price. But for NFT, it able to su support this even though it is a digital copy, it's a JPEG. But with the NFT. It actually, it actually is like a certif in a in a sim layman way of saying it's like a certifi certificate that certified that this item is genuine. Okay, so which means that if you say it's only one in the world, it's only one in the world. Everyone can have a copy of that JPEG, but only the person has the NFT together with that JPEG can claim that. So which make the one that he holds has the value. Same as Mona Lisa painting. You know, if let's say they came out like JPEG, everyone can have a copy of the Mona Lisa painting JPEG. But only the one that has the NFT can say that I have the original one and I'm the right owner. So which I can sell it at higher price. So that's the something about NFT. So when someone buy an NFT, when someone buy an NFT, they are not actually buying your photo. They are actually buying that NFT which is called non-fungible token together with your photo. Because your photo come together with it, okay. So um, that's one thing, okay. Because with that, all the digital asset get protected in term of value, okay. Like Nike, they want to keep come out their own NFT, they can say that this is original, okay. And then second thing is that, uh, what they call this, better royalty, better commissions, the system, okay. For example, if you sell a digital print. One is one you sold it, one time payment, that's all. So if the person sell it to another person, you know, you won't get any benefit from that. But on NFT, every time when there is a secondary transaction, you will still receive an amount of commission. For example, ten percent. So now if you get into NFT, even though let's say 
you are not somebody, you know, I'm just new. I just try, just no harm to try out, you know. Uh, they have NFT that you need to pay to create your NFT. They also have, you know, a way that you can try to create an NFT without paying anything. So that's why I encourage people to try out, to understand it, then only you able to know why it's a huge thing, why it means a lot to uh, creative artists, include photographers. Okay. So my, yeah. my, I guess my first question is, do you need to be an artist with a following to sell your NFTs? Because I imagine if everybody is just like, I mean, we have billions of people uploading photos to to Instagram, and if everybody is just like, well, now I'm going to make an NFT, I mean, what, what difference does it make? Uh, or do you need a following uh, in a kind of name for yourself to get people to buy your NFT? Or can just anybody, even a beginner, or the, just say, hey, here's my photo of this, and now I'm making an NFT, kind of like stock photography yes. is in, in a way. Do you know? Like, Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is a very good question, which is going to link to the Twitter. Okay. When you talk about NFT, right? Yes, someone may have huge followers, then definitely will get benefit, you know, the, from that. Because, you know, one of your audience maybe want to support you. You know, one of your audience, one of your followers maybe is a collector, which is definitely helps. Okay? But it doesn't mean that you can't get any sales. Because selling NFT is like selling a print. It's totally different things. So which is also means that, you know, you have re heard about story about those hype that, you know, someone just making a million overnight. No, that's most likely going, not going to happen to you. Don't, don't get misled, misled by that. Okay. Because that's a very wrong concept because you are running a business. If you run an NFT, you are running a, a selling print business, which is a digital print. Think it in this way. So you have to build it. Okay. So. The thing is here is that because this is, well, it's not really that new, but I think that I would say that it's just started to warm up the market uh, because you can see that on Twitter, there are a lot of famous photographers. They are also very new to Twitter. So they also start to grow their Twitter account there. And you will see a very interesting phenomenon that all the, the whole, the entire photography community each other trying to help each other, everyone trying to help each other to get the sales, okay, to sell their NFT. So people trying to retweak, you know, trying to share, trying to talk about that. So that's why the engagement is huge and the supportive, the support is there on Twitter, which is something that you don't really see on Facebook. Because Facebook, if you share a link to talk about your NFT, Facebook not going to promote that. People will, will yeah. just press it, make it less exposed Anytime to your followers. Anytime you share a link it, it on happens. Facebook, it does, performs much lower yes. than, say, if you just put a photo. Yes. Because Facebook wants you to pay right. to promote that. I believe that also happened on Instagram because Instagram is very hard for you right. to put a link. But on Twitter, it's easier. And people like to retweak your, 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 so your, your link. So one thing I hear is like... The, there, I've heard this thing about photographers, you know, like everybody says, oh, the, the, the NFT community is super supportive. And then I hear people who are selling NFTs sometimes say like, I'm buying other NFTs and I want to buy like a particular. Exactly. But to me, that exactly. sounds a little bit kind of like, have you heard of like a pyramid scheme? I don't know if you're familiar with that, where, it, where it's like, okay. oh, yes, well, I'll yes, buy yes, my yes, photo yes, if yes, you yes, buy yes. your photo. Okay. You know, I'll buy my photo <laughs> if... You buy Here's my. Thing. I'll buy your photo if you buy my photo. Do you know what I mean? And then it's like everybody buying uh, no, each no, other's no, no, photo. No, going to yeah. I, I I believe they are like, okay, you know, uh, depending on how you know, like for example, for me, let's say I able to get a sale, and I appreciate the community. Maybe I also help someone that just get into the NFT to buy that, you know, so that to fund them. It's like supporting them. With this is a good intention. But of course, like what you say that if someone. ABC, like if you buy my photo, only I will buy your photo. That is not like for the like. right way. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is not really like right way. Okay, but I'm going. I'm going to be very honest with you guys. They have a lot of people abuse this NFT. Not in photography. Photography world is kind of okay. Why? Because we're great because, people. Uh, Photographers people are nice to... people. <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 different thing because because the way people buy your photography work 
one is that mostly they like your work even though you want to support them also make sure that you buy something that you like right you know don't need to buy it because I just want to support you even though your follow is just you know I don't know why it's there but I just buy it because I want to support you no you can just post it like okay I want to buy to support the community I will pick the one that I like okay because photography is talk about uh, artistic value someone like your work someone will buy it okay but they have other NFT project which is known NFT they try to sell it with other add-on value photography can do that too but photography the basic is still that if people like your work people will buy it people appreciate it people want to support you people like it okay uh, but for other NFT project people can abuse it because people buy it why people think that I can make a lot of money from this NFT I bought it I'm going to resell it okay because of the right. some the things that you know they try to put some utility add on to it uh, but for photography you know because if you want to resell it uh, depending on how famous you are you maybe have but you also need to find the collector it's not something that oh I bought photo from someone I want to resell it tomorrow no most likely not going to happen that right it may take a bit time okay it may be, take a bit time to do that okay for the result but for other NFT project people do that you know people looking for like fast money people look at, looking for passive income which is possible for NFT to like you can hold an NFT and you get money so, you know it's possible but that is something that non photography but it's a huge thing it's a huge thing uh, NFT in a simple way of saying that NFT everything can be NFT okay everything can be converted into digital virtual land uh, photography, video, music, even idea, even uh, uh, you know, and what they call, you know, uh, an invention. So I heard that recently someone that there's an idea. Okay, I don't know how true is that. Someone told me that there's an idea that uh, the invent inventor they try to put their idea, their invention as an NFT, just to register it as a trademark. So a I I know you just started. Um, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but have you sold anything yet? No, yeah, I'm still very new. I'm still experiencing. Now it's more on uh, growing mm. the Twitter. So let's, that's my next growing question. Twitter. You had mentioned before we started that you were getting more engagement on Twitter these days. And I hear a lot of photographers are kind of abandoning Instagram or maybe even Facebook they already left because yes. Instagram Facebook will be yeah, in Instagram trouble. said uh, earlier I think about six months ago or something they said we're no longer a photo sharing platform where we're focusing more on video and they just and people kind of knew that but now they just really came out and said it so I noticed a lot of photographers are now using more video on, on Instagram um, and the other thing that's happening is people are kind of migrating to Twitter or starting Twitter accounts. So what's your, I don't, I have, I started a Twitter account many years ago. I don't even know if I made one post. I never use it. What's your experience been with Twitter but, so but far? So far, so good. I would say that it's good. It's very, very good. Okay. And you know, it reminds me of those days, right? Do you, do you realize that nowadays, photographer, if you want to get famous on Facebook, you want to get famous on Instagram, you are doing something that not just photography. Yeah, absolutely. People try to be try to be something more funny, mm -hmm. try to be on video, talk about something, maybe make something that interesting instead of mm -hmm. just taking photos. Which I I won't say is a bad way, uh, but there are people that are not good in that. Right. Okay. There are people just I take photos. I'm not that kind of like a funny person. You know, I cannot just add in front of the video. I just want to take photo mm -hmm. and share it, and that's what you can still back sit back to the old way. On okay. Twitter. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm, my suggestion because a lot of people scale NFT because it sounds a little bit too technical because the technology behind is what makes it so good. But to understand that, it requires an effort to study. But you should not because of afraid in that and don't get in. You try to get in and learn. There's a free way to do that, like on OpenSea. You can just create a wallet, MetaMask wallet. You just create your NFT on Polygon blockchain, which is free. At least it's for now, it's free. Okay, which, which is why I say it's a good time. You won't know that whether after some time, whether will it will still be free or not. Okay, so just try out, you know, you even though you may not be able to sell 
but you will be able to explore to this NFT world. You know what the world is going on. You know how this changed the community, and maybe you can work out something. Maybe you can grow your Twitter account. Maybe you can do some space. Uh, you know something like a clubhouse there. Okay, I just joined one yesterday for as a listener. <laughs> my first time okay uh, yeah you know just try and see how they grow it okay recently i said there's a uh, one person you know approached me i didn't release but have time to check in that that they talk about having a collection of nft which they will come with like you know limited uh edition which is something that they also link with like a trip to kenya or south africa same something like that mm. yeah they try to do that okay but of course you have to study first because to be honest they have a lot of scammers for the NFT. Okay. Okay. That's for the investor, for the collector. So, but that will be yourself to filter out, to be careful with that. Uh, but for, for us as photographer, create, you know, create and start first and you have nothing, you have no risk. Okay. As long as you don't click, don't simply click on any link that give away some free NFT. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that, uh, which is fine. But after studying, then yes, only you consider to buy an NFT. But, uh, I believe between photographers, collector and photographers, or photographer between photo, uh, between all the photographers, it should be quite safe because you know that uh that person is also a trusted photographers. Okay, it's not someone that's come coming out of nowhere. I want to buy your work. Okay, because that's not going to happen in photography. Like you know, I'm not going to give you a free NFT. For why would photographer want to have a free NFT? But that's happening in you know in other NFT project. You know there are people right. I want to give you a free NFT. Uh, suddenly talk about that but most likely there will be some uh some hacking you know going on at okay. the back there yeah all right um last question for you uh cha changing gears a bit again is uh what do you have planned for 2022 we've been in a pandemic for two years now i know you've been <laughs> stuck in malaysia and uh, in terms of photography or your own personal projects, is there anything you would like to shoot or any, anything you'd like to work on, any place you'd like to go? What, what, I know you do, you do architecture, photography, the, the black and white photography. You don't do just astrophotography. <laughs> uh, you do cityscapes. Do you do aerial stuff, stuff with drones. Uh, what, what is the, you know, yeah. this year, hopefully things will kind of open up soon. Lots of parts of the world are, are opening up. And I think Asia is slowly. What do you have um, in, the, in the months ahead for it's you? Really do you have any um, to... projects, goals or anything like that that you're like to do? I have some, you know, but more on local. Uh, because, you know, if you want to travel overseas, it's very, very hard to decide anything now. But now even for local trips, I also can't show that whether uh, will I be able to proceed uh, because the number is increased you know the number of daily cases increased in Malaysia uh, so that's why you know I can't have to see how it goes maybe it's also time for me to explore more about NFT or how to play with it uh, like say that you know like I'm trying to help the community even though I may not be able to get any sales now but you know I just focus on growing my Twitter I also have something in mind uh, shooting wise Maybe I'll just focus in travel in local first. You know, uh, <clears throat> we have some, yeah, I think it's more on travel mm. local, just explore around. Whether is it a, a trip, you know, you know, for myself or a trip for, you know, for, you know, uh, organize a tour for, for other photographers, which is, we will see how it goes. Because uh, nothing can really decide now. We have to right. play by ear. So... Speaking of yeah. that, you, you're a workshop leader. You lead workshops in Kuala Lumpur, photography workshops. You lead uh, photo tours uh, in Malaysia and around Asia. I know you do some free meetups from time to time. You post on Facebook, hey, guys, I'm going to yes. the reservoir or this lake at 2 a.m. Wow. And then like 50 cars yeah. show up to shoot Dude. the Milky Way with you. And then you also have... Um, an online school as well and school and community uh, too. So do you, why don't you tell us, yeah. uh, you know, if people want to learn with you or join your workshops, tours and whatnot, tell us a little bit about um, how people can, can uh, learn, learn photography with you. I think that uh, I have a masterclass, which is the, you know, we have a private Facebook group and I would, every week I would do a live sharing session there. Okay. I also have some recorder 
workshops videos there so we should talk about like astrophotography landscape photography and low exposure black and white photography there okay so if you uh, because I want to help people to build their skill um, <clears throat> so that's why I have this kind of sharing and usually it's like provide like lifetime membership because everyone has their own pace so and then if you want to learn more can find me on my Facebook page which is Grey Chow Photography or maybe on my website which is www.greychow.com so I think either way you know or you can just drop me a message okay if, if you have anything about photography you can always feel free to just ask me I'm fine okay yeah I'm okay to answer I'll, any questions. I'll put uh, links to yeah. those in the show notes below and I just want to say I uh, appreciate uh, all the the support you give to the photographic community you've helped me a ton uh, when I was in Malaysia introducing me to a lot of people places no and an amazing food uh, one of the yes, things I remember yes. most is all the incredible meals we've eaten together. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for for supporting and no helping problem. out the the photographic community both in Malaysia and abroad. So really appreciate that. So yeah, it was great talking to you, my friend, and uh, I hope we can meet up again same, in same, person same. sometime soon. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, I'm really can't wait to you know travel again. Yeah. All right, my friend. Take care, man. Take care. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to like and subscribe.